the same time as the pyramids. To see if these were the same layers as those at the Sphinx, the rocks were examined. At the tomb, the same soft flaky limestone was found, as well as types of fossil that were also at the Sphinx. It was exactly the same layer of rock. The independent expert had shown the critics were wrong. Shock was right, and the rock layers ran from the Sphinx to the tombs. The dramatically different weathering in each place was to identical layers of rock. Robert Schock now feels he's in a strong position to withstand Mark Lehner and the other critics. Since I've come up with my hypothesis of an older Sphinx, a lot of different geological theories have been proposed. In fact, not by geologists in most cases, but different scenarios to try to explain away my data. All of them have problems with them, and none of them seem to be cogent. None of them explain all of the data as completely as my hypothesis. And so far, I think my hypothesis is holding up. It hasn't been refuted, and I don't see any other one hypothesis as really displacing it or being a major challenge to it at this time. I know nothing about geology personally, so I can't make a judgment about the soundness of, of his theory originally or of the answering uh, theories of whether one is more sound than the other, but uh, I think that they, somebody's still going to have to come up with uh, a better argument to completely uh, persuade me and other people that uh, Shock doesn't have anything going. I, 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 I don't have an explanation for what uh, might have been the timing on Shock's uh, erosion ideas, but other than that, uh, the, the, the way that the Sphinx has been weathered is, seems to me to be uh, uh, likely how he has described it. If Robert Schock is right about the erosion, how old does that make the Sphinx? Date of the statue, roughly 5 to 7,000 BC, according to Schock. This date, if correct, would certainly mean the history of Egypt needs to be rewritten because it's up to 4,000 years before the building of the pyramids. What's the evidence for this new dating? This rock surface may look rock solid, but geologically speaking, it's porous, it's soft. With the seismographs, we can figure out exactly how soft it is and how deep that softening or weathering, we call it, goes. Now, the depth of weathering correlates with how long the rock's been exposed. Since this rock was exposed when the Sphinx was first carved out, this gives us a very powerful tool to try to figure out how old exactly the Sphinx is. If you look in other areas, not very far away, like Palestine, Jericho in particular, people at the same time, 5 to 7,000 BC and even earlier, were in fact carving into solid bedrock what they call moats in Jericho. They were building stone structures. So I don't think this is crazy or ludicrous or outside the realm of possibilities. Shock and I have a, a debate, or it, it's a disagreement, I guess you could call it, on the dating. The Sphinx at the moment, at the equinox, is not aligned with the sunrise. It was aligned with the sunrise, or would have been aligned with the sunrise, during the age of Leo, which is around 10,000 BC. In other words, from 10,000 BC to 8,000 BC, at the equinox, the sun would have come up directly between the paws of the Sphinx. It no longer does that. Anybody going to the trouble to build the Sphinx and knowing how important astronomical alignments were to the ancients, the fact that at 10,000 BC or thereabouts, the sun would rise between the paws seems to me a piece of evidence that certainly has to be taken into consideration. The way the monuments of ancient Egypt are seen will be changed forever if either of these dates is correct. But Shock's date, seven to nine thousand years ago, could double the lifespan of the statue. If he's right, the building of the pyramids would no longer be civilization's first great achievement, but instead the inheritance of an earlier tradition. John West's date, 10 to 12,000 years ago, means that before our ancestors even formed stable communities, there was a mysterious culture with abilities as great or perhaps greater than anything that came later.
But these distant dates for the builders of the Sphinx are uncertain and speculative. More evidence is needed. Water is the key. If it was rain that eroded the Sphinx, when was the Sahara wet enough? Time Watch commissioned a study in the laboratories of Drylands Research at Sheffield University, an international center for deserts, their water and their people. We asked the scientists when the desert had been wet and when people had lived there. If we go to the Eastern Sahara today, we find that it's a very harsh environment. It gets about 50 millimeters of rain a year. It's very dry, it's very hot, it's very windy. Most of the life centers around the Nile River. But it hasn't always been like that. If we go back to about 4,500 years ago, when the pyramids were built, we can tell that this area was indeed much wetter than it is today. Now, the main evidence we have to suggest this comes from the extensive lake sediments in this area. And these lake sediments act basically as an environmental tape recorder. And trapped within them is a record of what the environment was like in the past. Now, Pollen, for example, from these has indicated that rainfall was probably in the order of about 400 millimetres a year. Now, that isn't unlike the amount of rainfall we get in some parts of East Anglia today. Between 7,000 and 10,000 years ago, the climate did tend to fluctuate a little bit. So we have wetter and drier periods. Humans still lived in this area, but they tended to live by hunting. They developed very, very sophisticated specialist tools for their way of life. But at about 10,000 years ago, we see quite a dramatic change in the climate of this region. Indeed, throughout this period from 10,000 years ago to 20,000 years ago, we have no evidence that any humans were living in this area. This was an area that was very dry, was very cold. It was the time of the last ice age. If we go back further in time, before 20,000 years ago, we find evidence throughout this area that humans lived here. These are stone tools from about 30,000, 40,000 years ago, and their presence in this region suggests that it was a much wetter place. Whether a new date for the Sphinx goes back this far, or simply to wetter times in the 6,000 years before the pyramids, there's still one major theoretical problem. Where are the other remains of the earlier people who might have built the Sphinx? Could the evidence of a whole civilization just be washed away? There's absolutely no doubt that the, the Earth passed through a traumatic period between 15,000 BC and 8,000 BC. What happened in those 7,000 years was that ice in the northern hemisphere that had taken 50,000 years to build up, completely all of it melted and most of it melted in about 2,000 years. We had massive animal extinctions all across, across the planet, particularly in the 11th millennium BC. More than 70 genera of, of animals were, were completely wiped out uh, at this point. Um, it's quite obvious that the human species was affected by this as well. We were around. Men and women, just like us, just like ourselves, um, went through the experience of the last ice age. Uh, it was an experience, as I say, that completely changed the face of the world. And I think if we're looking for a lost civilization and to what got it lost, the answer lies at the end of the last ice age. That's why the traces are so faint, because it's very, very, very far back. It's a long way back, and we find echoes of it in myths and in certain monuments. I felt that the matter was effectively proven, and this is what I continue to feel. In other words, until somebody can come along with a theory that shows why the Sphinx is weathered the way that it is, and the stuff right alongside it is not weathered, uh, the matter is, as far as I'm concerned, absolutely cut and dried and proven. John West's success has filled him with confidence. He now feels liberated to speculate even more wildly about the origins of human civilization. He's on his way to see another promoter of unlikely ideas, Richard Hoagland, who believes that the Sphinx is linked to Mars. Actually, Hoagland is looking for a connection between the landforms on Mars, which he is convinced are artificial, and I'm now becoming convinced that they are artificial, and the monuments of Egypt, specifically the pyramids and the Sphinx, and even more specifically the Sphinx and the pyramids. Many people over the last 10 years that I've been working on this, innumerable people have said to me, 
you know that kind of looks like the Sphinx in Egypt? Have you noticed the, the bars on the side, the headdress and all that? West isn't going to dismiss the idea of a Sphinx on Mars. It fits in with his belief that more advanced cultures than our own have existed. If you could prove that there were artificial landforms on another planet, on Mars, that would totally disrupt our whole notion, not just of the evolution of civilization, but of the uniqueness of human beings on Earth. Would, I mean, it would demonstrate the validity of, of ideas that were, until quite recently, totally the province of science fiction. And it would, I think, in and of itself, absolutely discredit the religious organization that I like to call the Church of Progress that is behind our education in its entirety. In other words, it would upset an even bigger apple cart than anything that I might do. And since I delight in upsetting that particular apple cart, I would love to see it validated. I don't think that uh, once we get into that realm of science fiction that Egyptologists are going to be in the least bit moved to uh, pay any attention to it at all. When John Anthony West starts talking about a Sphinx on Mars or maybe some kind of connection between um, the Sphinx of Giza in Egypt and some kind of Martian Sphinx or the face on Mars, my involvement ends at that point, really. I have to say, frankly, that I think he's gone beyond the stratosphere and beyond, I, beyond where I want to follow. And if West is right in that, more power to him. Maybe my children and grandchildren will be learning about the Martian colonization of Earth. But right now, I don't believe that with any degree of probability. Whatever seemingly incredible belief he goes on to investigate next, it is to John West's credit that his theory of a Sphinx much older than the conventional date has survived the academic challenge. It may be that civilization is older than we thought. The heavens have opened up, the rivers are swelling, and Jimmy Kelly's being sweet. Oh, God, it's Armageddon. Grace? All right, if I give you a hug? The kind of hug you'd like, you know, give your cousin if you weren't already engaged to her. And company. Breakfast is ready. He's cooking while speaking to me in a demeaning manner. <laughs> I think that's progress. Back in a new series of Grace Under Fire next Thursday at 10 on BBC Two. BBC Two's Saturday night service gets heavy at nine with Rock Family Trees and Deep Purple. It got to the point where the cocaine was my career. After Saturday night armistice at 9.50, normal service resumes with Wimbledon and highlights of the ladies' singles finals at 10.25. Comedy drama in Long Gone at 11.25. Give me some of that white meat! A third-rate basketball team who unexpectedly hit the big time. Game, set and match to BBC Two. Tennis action now on BBC Two. The latest state of play, including the ladies' semi-finals, today at Wimbledon.
Hello. Any doubts there may have been about the quality of women's tennis here at Wimbledon were dispelled this afternoon with two riveting semi-finals. Today we were looking for Steffi Graf to take a step closer to her sixth Wimbledon title. She last won here in 93. The year that saw one of the most emotional moments ever on centre court. This afternoon, Jana Votner was out for revenge. Last year, it was Conchita Martinez depriving Martina of another emotional moment as she celebrated her first Grand Slam title. Today, Conchita was facing her compatriot, Arancha Sanchez Vicario, who's always had the potential to be a center court favorite. top four on court today and they didn't let us down and I'm pleased to welcome back uh, to the studio the lady in red tonight I've got to say Pam Shriver. Well it was a bright day of tennis so I decided to wear an outfit to match it. Absolutely. Well the first match we're going to look at this evening is Steffi Graf against Jana Novotna. Graf has been improving with every match and on Tuesday admitted she was playing near perfect tennis. It hasn't been quite so easy for Novotna dropping one set along the way to her fifth Grand Slam semi-final. Many expected Graf to breeze through once again, but it wasn't to be as Novotna made an inspired start. She held on to win the first set 7-5 and broke in the opening game of the second, but Graf, like all great champions, broke back straight away. We join it at 3-all, Graf serving. Much better forehand. Fifteen long. And that's an example of the short forehand that Groff hates to handle. Really anticipating the forehand side of Groff well. Seldom does she try for the topspin lob. But Yana quick to turn. It's always a little bit awkward when you have to go back behind your backhand side. Yana Novotna does everything right on this point. Great approach. Steffi still hits a forehand. Great get on the volley. And it's the, it's the height of that ball that is awkward for Yana.
30, 40. Well, a fairly ordinary forehand, halfway down the net. But again, it's Jan and Navarro, no, a break point. Use. Well, Heinz has been through it all before. In fact, there's a lot of deja vu here. Deuce. Fifth double fault gives her another break point. Well, that was certainly a, Use. a shot that she had options with. Important thing on the uh, forehand volley is to make sure you don't break your wrist and you don't let that bottom side of the racket pop up. Very good sound technical forehand volley. Look how it's all one. <laughs> 